Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the SEBA SES P3 or Risk Management Complete Essentials Revision. This is segment number 3 which is on Strategy Risk. Let's get started. Uh, before we get started, uh, a quick reminder on the kind suggestions I have to offer. Uh, please have a notebook and pen on the ready. Follow the slides and my explanation carefully. Make notes as you deem necessary. Uh, do maintain a list of key topics that you feel you are weak at. So you can self-revise later and maintain a list of key performance and management tools that can help model answers in the SES. Um, a quick reminder on the essentials, the co-activities, as you know, D and E, evaluating and mitigating risk and uh, recommending and maintaining a sound control environment. These are the primary skills that the CS examiner will test. So, strategy risk. Now, before we look at the risk element, First, let's uh, quickly recap what strategy is. As you can see, the next couple of slides is going to be a quick snapshot of a couple of chapters in E3, enterprise strategy, because that is exactly what we are trying to discuss here from the risk angle. As you know, the uh, general definition for strategy is a course of action, including the specification of resources required to achieve a specific objective. While JSW, Johnson, Scholes and Whittington explain strategy to be the direction and scope of an organization over the long term which achieves advantage for the organization through its configuration of resources within a changing environment to meet the needs of the market and to fulfill the stakeholders expectation so these are just general things practically if you remember what strategy means is simply how do we get things done so strategy is a means to achieve sustainable competitive advantage and in terms of risk management, the test of a good strategy is whether it enables an organization to use its resources and competencies advantageously in the context of an ever-changing environment. Does or is our strategy resilient enough to withstand these changes of the environment and to continuously propel the company towards success? If our risk management policy and the risk management framework of the company is sound and strong, that is exactly what our strategy will be able to do. Now, as you know, as far as strategic planning is concerned, there's the, the formal or the rational planning approach and the, uh, well, the lack of it. Now, a quick reminder on the rational model, as you can see here, uh, this is widely adopted to develop strategy. Uh, mission and objectives then you do the position audit and the appraisal environmental appraisal then you come up with strategic options then you evaluate them and choose the strategy then you implement it uh, ultimately leading to review and control you do it cyclically uh, jsw grouped this model into three stages strategic analysis strategic choice and strategic implementation now risk management mainly focuses on the strategic choice part of this that looks at the choice or the choices a company has. Now, in contrast to the rational planning model, you definitely have the emergent or the incremental models. So, logical incrementalism uh, initially proposed by Lindblom suggests that current strategy tends to be a small scale extension of past policy rather than radical Change. He does not believe that the rational model of decision making is sensible and suggests that in the real world it is rarely used. So you are basically layering your future on the past incrementally. That is what logical incrementalism is. In reality, strategies may evolve in response to unexpected events that impact on the organization. Mintzberg referred to them as emergent strategies. Now, emergent strategies are often more acceptable to stakeholders as consultation, compromise and accommodation are built into the process. They emerge. However, incrementalism may mean that the organization has no overall long-term plan. 
causing it to suffer from strategic drift which could eventually lead to the company being unable to meet the needs of the customers so while that is the case we have to have a fair understanding of what emergent and incremental models and and the subtle differences of those two as well that's a quick recap on the e3 element now let's get to the risk side of things which is basically our chapter risks of formal planning so there are several risks embedded throughout the entire process one setting corporate objectives it could be difficult for the organization to create an overall mission and objectives short term pressures the pressures on management are often short term results difficulties in forecasting accurately may be hard to identify long term trends in the market in your position or it and your appraisal there can be bounded rationality meaning is that the external and uh, internal analysis undertaken as part of a long term strategic planning exercise can be often incomplete right the boundary uh, might not exactly be the extent to which we need to be considering rigidity once a long term plan is created managers often believe it should be followed at all costs then you have the cost aspect the strategic planning process can be very costly involving the use of specialists sometimes a specialist department and even take up management time and management distrust the strategic planning process involves the use of management accounting techniques including forecasting modeling cost analysis and operational research and so setting the objectives can be difficult short term pressures unwarranted ones forecasting made difficult the bounded rationality aspect rigidity cost and distrust of management are key risks of formal planning let's also look at the risks in the lack of formal planning if you let strategy emerge or if you let strategy incrementally layer one you could face the failure to identify threats the business is not being forced to look ahead in that case the second is strategic drift where the organization does not have an overall plan for the future meaning that it may be difficult for it to effectively compete in its market in the long term third one difficulty in raising finance investors typically like to know what plans the organization has for the future so determining that could be difficult management skill prevailing basically the third one let me just go back the third one is basically saying that budgeting can be difficult because you don't have a plan there is no formal planning in that case uh, your organization is working in high highly uncertain terms isn't it so it's always better to have a plan that's what they mean there management skill prevailing opportunists require managers that are highly skilled at understanding and reacting to the changing market then the uh, ultimate question which approach fits formal or emergent now it's it's a matter of suitability end of the day because formal planning approaches tend to suit organizations which exist in relatively stable industries meaning there is sufficient time to undertake detailed strategic analysis have relatively inexperienced managers as the formal planning approach helps to ensure they are familiar with the organization as well as providing a series of guidelines they can follow to help them develop a strategy now informal approaches tend to suit organizations which are in dynamic fast changing in industries where there is little time to undertake formal strategic analysis and have experienced innovative managers who are able to quickly identify and react to changes in the organization and its environment if if you don't have this kind of people uh coming up with uh, you know or not having formal planning will be very very difficult and you have to have the right people who can resiliently change fast and adapt and respond uh and also uh, do not need to raise significant external finance uh, external investors typically prefer a formal planning approach so uh, by contrast i think for the strategic case study and if you really if you take a moment to apply this to the strategic case study situation this slide is very important in the sense that you understand the suitability because when you analyze your pre scene when you analyze your company you are supposed to identify whether your company is operating in a relatively stable environment 
or if it's a dynamic and fast changing one depending on that the suitability of whether the strategy that you should be adopting is formal or emergent can be decided that's why this is very very important now for a moment we are going to pay attention to not for profits one of the fundamental challenges especially if you, we don't know uh, there could always be the pre scene that involves a not for profit uh, you could have objective setting challenges now this challenge mainly exists because not for profits do not make a profit obviously by which their success or failure can be measured one of the approaches to address this problem is to use the vfm technique the value for money technique that is the three e's economy efficiency and effectiveness economy is input management efficiency is the process management and effectiveness is output to outcome measurement but there are risks associated with using the three e's one obviously with any kpi as you can have uh, the wrong choice of measures could be used just because you can measure something doesn't mean you should so you really should be very careful what you choose to measure the measures can give contradictory results and that may mean your pri you prioritize one or two of the measures over the others internal confusion over which measures to prioritize that can lead to demotivated workers and all the measures being missed as a result economy and efficiency can be in conflict with effectiveness and that is the most common conflict there economy and efficiency uh, with effectiveness given that spending more can improve effectiveness or spending less can reduce the effectiveness in most cases today you live in a day and age where at least in the corporate setting uh, especially when there are large amounts of people large numbers of people involved uh, there is always the sentiment to say spend more uh, to get the job done but not really the case then you have economy and efficiency being often viewed as easier to measure than effectiveness especially in a nfp not for profit context because in a nfp uh, figuring out whether you have been effective or not is a very daunting task uh, because the objectives are not monetary uh, to be exact so in that case uh, this can be the focus of performance measures or audits the fact that uh, you can easily measure economy and efficiency than effectiveness you might end up focusing too much on the first two e's instead of the last e these are some of the risks associated with the three e's now let's take a look at the various strategic planning approaches that you have learned especially in e3 and the associated risks there are uh, fundamentally about two or three approaches that we discuss here we will be looking at three number one is the traditional approach which the the focus is on stakeholders uh, by and large so stakeholders objectives are very important but this approach can be risky if objectives are set in isolation from market considerations and are thus unrealistic then you can have the market led or positioning approach where the focus is on the customer the main risk with the positioning approach lies in predicting the future some markets are so volatile that it is impossible to estimate further ahead than the immediate short term there you go third is the resource based or competence led approach where the focus is on your own capability now in this case the risk is that the company becomes obsessed by the things that they can do and lose sight of what is happening in the market and what the customers want so your primary focus is what can i provide what do i have and with what i have what can i do now, this could lead to products becoming overly complicated and containing features that the customer does not really want or understand so there we go uh, it's important to know especially what approach you are currently following while also knowing uh, the risk because if you are aware of the risk it's okay because then you can actively mitigate that risk while ensuring now for example just because uh, there, there is a risk of you losing sight of what is happening in the market if you're following a resource based approach doesn't mean it's bad this means that you have to be very careful in deploying that strategy 
and undertaking that approach. So if you are aware of the risk, you can pay attention to that risk and manage it accordingly. Competitive strategy. Now, some of the what we are going to do is now, uh, I think this will closely relate to the second chapter uh, or the third, if I'm yes, either one of the two in E3, because in E3 you look at all these different strategic planning tools. Here, we are going to critically look at them. We are going to look at, we are basically going to criticize them. First criticism will be on Porter's generic approach. Here you have uh, a snapshot of the Porter's uh, generic strategy matrix, uh, which basically classifies strategic scope and or you pit strategic scope against competitive stance, which ultimately ends up with uh, classifying strategy broadly uh, into cost leader, differentiator and focus. There are a number of problems with Porter's generic strategies model. One, Porter's argument that any business that attempts to adopt more than one of the generic strategies will become stuck in the middle or maybe too simplistic. Porter suggested that this is because a business will be unable to successfully implement more than one at the same time leading to strategic drift. Now to what extent is this really true is a matter of debate. Uh, because it, it is not always true but this is one one potential risk now cost leadership in itself may not give competitive advantage failure to pass on cost savings to customers through lower prices could mean that the business fails to gain an edge over rivals so you you aggressively pursue cost leadership uh, it might end up uh, taking you too far where you can't really sustain on the differentiation aspect, it may not always lead to a business being able to command a high price for its goods. For example, it could be used to generate more sales. So the differentiator's objective, why you are differentiating, for example, you have a good example would be Samsung. In terms of the mobile phone market, the way they differentiate while you have premium products, also products to the, at the lowest price tag. Uh, is a good example of how differentiation can cater to uh, the wider market and all kinds of customers. Uh, in specifically looking at cost leadership alone, what are the kind of risks you face? There is no fallback if the leadership position is lost. The key risk for example, strengthening of the currency may make imports of substitute goods cheaper and the organization must continually adapt to ensure unit prices are kept low and consumer needs are met. Sorry, there was a slight distraction. Uh, now, now in, in trying to aggressively pursue cost leadership, the problem is that you have to maintain that status. And while technology is advancing and there are other players entering the market, if you're especially, you know, if you're operating in a very dynamic industry, you have new entrants and substitutes and tech and disruption and all that, uh, this is going to be a challenging task. Risks in differentiation, there is a need to continually innovate to defend that position. That is a key aspect. And you get to manufacture smaller volumes and the fact that uh, the products can get outdated faster also is a, a key aspect. Associated costs like marketing would also be higher. In that aspect also you have to be very careful when you are differentiating you have to find the right balance. You don't really want to put too much money into a product that is not going to sell too much uh, and also end up with bigger stocks which cannot sell at the end of the day. Performance in a recession also could be poor because you, you instead of having one good product, you have several products with a high risk element of whether or with, with an uncertainty level, whether you will be able to sell or not. Uh, finally, risks in focus and also the niching aspect. If successful, it could attract other cost leaders and differentiators due to the potential low barrier that exists. Low volumes could be sold. And the niche must be large enough in terms of potential buyers. The niche must have growth potential and predictability. And it also must be of negligible interest to major competitors.
and the firm must have strategic capability to enable effective service of the niche. So as you can see, while Porter's generic approach is a, is a classic strategic planning tool that is used uh, wide and across the world, uh, there are key risk elements in undertaking any of the strategy and therefore it is important that you have a sound understanding of uh, how these risks can affect your business. As a result, come up with effective solutions uh, as far as the case study is concerned. Another tool, very famous tool that you get to use is Ansoft's matrix, a commonly used model for analyzing the possible strategic directions that an organization can follow and be useful in strategic options generation as well. This is a snapshot of uh, the Ansoft's matrix as you know and as you've learnt for E3. Uh, the classification is that market and product are the two axes. You have existing market, new market versus new product, existing product which ultimately leads to four types of uh, strategic, mainly four types of strategic options, penetration, development, market and development product and the diversification aspect. And as you can see here in the heat map that is being provided, that has been applied, uh, the higher risk that you're going to uh, face is when you're trying to enter a new market with a new product. Because there is so much that you don't know. And generally, you say that market penetration is the lowest uh, risky strategy under the ANSOF matrix because uh, you're already operating in that market. It's an existing market and existing product, which means you have the right kind of information. But end of the day, also remember higher the risk, higher the return. So with respect to ANSOF's matrix, there are specific angles we can approach. One is that market penetration is the lowest risk option. So given the risk reward trade-off, it is also likely to yield the lowest return. The key risk therefore is that it does not generate the returns the organization needs. For example, a company could increase their advertising spend significantly, but they may well have already reached all of their target market already and so fail to increase sales. So this is the thing. Now it would be common sense not to try to penetrate a market that has already been penetrated. That's the, it's a commonsensical matter. Then obviously you're going to look at different things, but if you are not that, if you don't have that view, and maybe if you don't have that visibility even you might end up trying to penetrate a market thinking that there is more space in that market more customers in that market but actually when there isn't that is a key risk on the product development aspect this increases the risk for an organization in terms of for example like r and d costs can be significant in product design and development and if the resultant product is not appropriate their co-market or if a competitor gets to the market quicker or with a better product then the new product may fail leading to significant losses on the market development strategy new markets can be very varied the company could be selling to a new segment for example it could be age range or the sex and it could be selling to a new country even however an organization chooses to develop its market it must do thorough research into whether their entry into the market is viable. Failure as well as significant cost of entry and exit could also lead to reputational damage. So, Now if you look at, if you analyze the case study exams, at least in every exam there's going to be this one variant. Uh, we don't know whether you are going to be the lucky person, but there is always going to be that one variant where there is a market development exercise. Somebody is going to enter into a new market. or some other player in a different market is either going to acquire you, therefore there is a market development angle to it. How are you going to tackle those situations? One key skill you need to have is whether you are aware of the way things can go wrong. All right. Finally, the diversification aspect which is considered to be the riskiest option. Now, when you are trying to diversify in terms of related in the vertical integration aspect, that can be less risky because of the familiarity. Uh, it could be either buying a supplier or a customer. For example, uh, if you take a chain of pubs, buying a brewery or vice versa. Now, there is knowledge and similarities to the current operations. 
but it can increase your reliance on the market you serve and reduce choice. If for example you bought a supplier and then had issues, it would not be as easy to switch the supplier given you now own a competitor. So there is, it's, it's, it's this very careful strategic game that you need to play and uh, one good example is that most uh, mergers and acquisitions in the world so far have been a failure. Most of them, majority of them are proven by research and uh, the, the time it takes to realize the synergies itself are almost always like almost always almost 100% all the time much longer than they initially anticipated. So these are key risks in uh, diversification. Unrelated diversification is very very risky. This is entering a market with no common thread to the current operations. The key risks with this are a lack of knowledge and skills, the cost of entry, the time it would take to develop the share in the market. Sometimes this leads to companies uh, to acquire an existing company to enter into that market. Right. Now let's take a look at acquisition and coupling of companies, that is mergers and acquisition. Acquisition refers to a corporate action in which a company buys most, if not all, of the target company's ownership stakes in order to assume control of the target firm. Mergers are combinations that result from the creation of a new reporting entity formed from the combining parties. Acquisition obviously has some significant benefits over internal growth. Synergy, like the, the, <laughs> the most marketed benefit of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, defined as the advantage to a firm gained by having existing resources which are compatible with new products or markets that the company is developing. Avoids barriers to entry. So there is that consolidation angle. Less reaction from competitors. And it can block a competitor. It can, like if you can absorb a competitor, there you go. You know, you've lost a competitor there. It can help restructure the operating environment. Relative price to earnings ratio, right? there are uh, various plays you can do. One good example is bootstrapping to elevate the, uh, mul the price multiple uh, and in, as a result uh, even pitch a higher value to your company during the negotiation process. And there we go, asset valuation. So these are some of the benefits, general benefits. Quick uh, reminder on your F3 angle. However, we need to focus on the risk. What are the risks associated with this method of growth? Acquisition can be more costly than internal growth because the owners of the acquired company will have to be paid for the risk already taken. Differences in managers salaries. Now the example of cultural mismatch that illustrates how managers are valued, especially in different countries or different industries. Lack of knowledge. Despite the due diligence that you are supposed to undertake, there is the risk of not knowing all there is to know about the business it seeks to buy. Reduction in ROC. Quite often acquisitions add to sales and profit volume without adding to value creation. Even in that sense, it can be very risky. So the, the, the whole story about mergers and acquisitions is that are you getting into a smart mandate? Is it really smart? Is it sensible? Are you doing it at the right time, at the right place, with the right company, with the right intention? As you know, for example, uh, I, I am re reminded of uh, one very famous acquisition that was heavily publicized in 2015 and 2016. It happened, the Kraft and Heinz merger. And these were two individual companies that were doing wonderfully at the time. But what happened after they combined? together they formed Kraft Heinz and uh, there was a buzz saying once the combination happens uh, they will become the second largest FMCG company in the world but now they're nowhere near and uh, in fact the originality of their individualistic color of their products has been lost uh, and what Warren Buffett did was make himself more money uh, like if you look at the stock chart, the stock price, uh, you clearly understand because the price is now uh, at the level where it was before the merger was announced. 
so the merger happened prices went up the investors made their money they sold their shares profited came back and uh, got out of the company ownership and now uh, the price has settled to what it truly is so uh, while the the worst thing that ha that happened with the merger is uh, the squeezing strategy that buffett has where thousands and thousands of people lost jobs that's what happened there we go uh, that's why uh, we have to be very careful when you look at a merger and acquisition because it really has to be smart uh, let's talk a little bit about the control aspect especially if you're going into m and a the key control for an acquisition is due diligence a control to reduce the likelihood of overpaying for a target company so due diligence is an investigation of a business prior to signing a contract it relates to the process through which a company will evaluate a target and their asset prior to acquisition it should provide information that allows for more informed decision making regarding the acquisition excuse me there is always risk involved in any acquisition but the work done here is designed to help reduce the uncertainty and control the risks that the acquirer will face as they go through the acquisition and afterwards as the company looks to make success of the combined entity so it has to be very thorough this process is particularly important if a private company is the target because public company has statutory requirements of reporting and therefore there is a lot of visibility private company you have to be very careful because you don't really know what is going on inside due diligence would be the first opportunity for the acquirer to obtain some of the information on the target as it would not be available from public sources so it's just a quick snap on the common areas of focus during a due diligence exercise uh, financial statements strategic fit employee issues management issues property owned competition commission any complaints etc uh, intellectual property contract review pending litigation tax aspects insurance aspects etc right so there's a lot to look at in a due diligence exercise i can share my experience with uh, you but uh, perhaps we can bring it in live sessions respect to due diligence right so then we move to a slightly different slightly different aspect of joint development or uh, development through coupling there are many methods for an organization to grow jointly obviously you can have a joint venture which is a separate business entity whose shares are owned by two or more business entities strategic alliances which is a corporate business activity a cooperative business activity formed by two or more separate organizations for strategic purposes while preserving their separate identity and autonomy so the difference the primary difference between a joint venture and a strategic alliance is that in a jv you establish a separate entity you register it you incorporate it there is a separate business in a strategic alliance it's a partnership so it's more of an effort and there is no company franchising which is the purchase of the right to exploit a business brand in return for a capital sum and a share of profits or turnover licenses this is the right to exploit an invention or resource in return for a share of proceeds and differs from a franchise because there is little or no central support so there is that that key difference between franchising and licensing uh, which would be important uh, for you to pay attention to outsourcing contracting out aspects of the work of the organization previously done in house to specialist providers so when you are trying to develop in in joint approaches what are the key considerations uh, especially there we go sharing of costs sharing of benefits sharing of risks ownership of resources control or decision making are the key considerations when you are getting into a joint development approaches now let's take a look at the risk aspect in fact uh, if you pay attention this slide this entire slide is a quick recap on e3 now key risks one 
the strategic fit the partner chosen needs to have a similar strategy because by association the two or more collaborating firms will affect each other's reputation the cost sharing aspect the two companies will have to come to an agreement over how costs are split or who bears particular costs that can be a tricky thing knowledge sharing by partnering with a firm there is a risk that an organization may have to reveal some of its trade secrets depending on how close the collaboration profit sharing the ultimate aim for most collaborations is to increase the collaborating organization's ability to make money therefore a key discussion point must be how the profits are split loss of control partnering with the other organizations requires trust that the partner will perform its work to the same standard as normal so if trust is breached uh, you might lose control of the entire situation loss of development opportunities collaboration is often used to enter into a new geographic market or offer a service or product the company did not previously provide so in that sense uh, perhaps there was a larger potential customer segment that you could have tapped into but now the fact that you are working with someone diminishes that entire potential and on top of the uh, fact that you have to share everything these are some of the key risks of joint development methods so please keep them in mind if ever the case study pitches you some for some of some form of joint development approach uh, and you have to evaluate the risky aspect or if you have to evaluate a joint development strategy in itself you are definitely supposed to bring in the risk aspect to your discussion next let's take a look at international expansion so if you look at the strategies to expand abroad one obviously you have exporting the firm sells products made in its home country to buyers abroad this often starts with the receipt of a chance order or perhaps poor sales at home uh, which forces the business to export or collapse overseas manufacture the firm may either manufacture its products in a foreign country and then either import them back to its home country so there are companies like that in sri lanka a good example is brandix or you can sell them abroad either way the firm is involved in direct foreign investment because it is purchasing capital assets in another country multinational these firms coordinate their value adding activities across national boundaries for example a multinational car manufacturer like toyota will have engine plants in one country body plants in another and electrics in a third production capacity is often duplicated around the world then you have the transnational aspect which are nationless firms that have no home country employees and facilities are treated identically regardless of where they are in the world the company may be listed on several national stock exchanges and even the operational element uh, one good example or one good uh, fact is that they will extensively use uh, technology to enable the company's uh, operational and the business aspect so these are the strategies you have to expand abroad now what are the risks you are looking at international growth or rather market development right getting into a new market political risk obviously the risk that government policy may make it difficult to operate successfully in the new country foreign exchange risk the risk that earnings could be reduced by currency fluctuations the need for capital investment this will be lower if an exporting strategy is used the risks to customer relationship even the distance between the manufacturer and its foreign consumers this can be hard to maintain in an exporting strategy increased risks in the supply chain manufacturing at a distance from your target market will increase the cost of getting the units to them another risk ethical risks if operating in countries with less developed labor laws then should the company take advantage of this keep the costs low or the company be ethical and good example is what happened to nike in some of their production facilities and their practices uh, in some of the asian countries then you have the cultural risks managing operations in foreign countries can be difficult due to differences in language and customs this can also make advertising and operational control very very difficult therefore 
uh, you have to be very smart again if you're looking at international expansion right so now after looking at some of the strategic planning and the strategic option tools looking at the risky aspect of things uh, we are moving to a slightly uh, bigger or rather different segment which is disruption what is disruption a disruptive innovation is new development commonly involving advancement in tech that changes or disrupts an existing market or potentially creates a new market that leads to the replacement of an existing market and can often lead to well-known firms or products having a significant drop in sales. What is the role of tech? Technological advancements play a huge part in disruptive innovation where a company or an individual identifies how technology can be used to make life easier. Sometimes the disruption is an unintended consequence of the technological advancement. And sometimes the intended disruption doesn't materialize. So that's the thing, you know, you uh, either you plan to get to point A, but you end up getting to point C and point C is much better. Or you were planning to get to point A uh, and you don't get there. So these are all risks associated tech. And I mean, who knew when Zuckerberg started Facebook that it would today uh, be the most dangerous social and technological tool available for governments and for anyone who wants to exploit it. Who knew that? Nobody. But it disrupted and brought in so much of risk. Now we are going to look at considerations for successful disruption. But before, uh, right. One, simplicity. The ease of ordering on Amazon is one of their reasons for success as a disruptor. Then you have the resources angle, using less of a scarce resource or generally being more environmentally friendly. Cost, a key consideration for most purchasers, whether they are individual consumers or businesses, and the reason that many battles are won. Accessibility, the ability to use a device or application makes it a more appealing alternative. And quality, doing something significantly better than it is currently done can also be a source of disruption. So when you look at these words, simplicity, resources, cost, accessibility, and quality, these are all very positive aspects to disruption. And if the motive of disruption is are these, then you've always got a positive outcome. However, you have to pay attention to the previously here. You have to pay attention to this particular line where you either end up with unintended consequences or uh, you don't or you are unable to materialize what you initially were hoping to achieve through disruption. All right. Now, uh, another uh, very important aspect with respect to strategic planning, especially in the dynamic world we live in is scenario planning because scenarios are plenty. You never know what can happen. You never know how things can go. Therefore, scenario planning has become a very useful tool. If you uh, open your Microsoft Excel window or a Power BI window or a Tableau window, you know that scenario planning is embedded in all these softwares. So generally, uh, quick, uh, I would like to start with a quick recap on the steps in scenario planning. One, identify high impact, high uncertainty factors in the environment. Two, for each factor, identify different possible futures. Then you cluster them together, the different factors, to identify consistent future scenarios because we don't really want to duplicate or create build scenarios for each and every variable it can be a very unnecessary task. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then you write the scenario. For the most important scenarios, usually you limit it to three. You come up with level one, level two, level three, or scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. Build a detailed analysis to identify and assess future implications. Five, for each scenario, identify and assess possible causes of action for the firm. Six, you monitor reality to see which scenario is unfolding. And finally, uh, you revise or redeploy the scenarios and strategic options as appropriate or fit to the situation. These are the steps. However, 
when you construct scenarios there are fundamental considerations to keep in mind you have to use a team for a range of opinions and expertise or else you can't really come up with multiple scenarios you have to identify the time frame markets products and the budget stakeholder analysis is important who will be the most influential in the future trend analysis and uncertainty identification so even in terms of stakeholder because uh, if you're coming up with scenarios if things are going to be very different one year down the line uh, you want to have an idea of who is going to be able to exert the most amount of influence because then you have to plan to cater to that possibility uh, same that kind of behavior analysis that you do in terms of trend analysis and uncertainty because you're trying to predict the future and how it goes you see this uh, method uh, being employed in differential uh, maths or uh, the use of differentials to predict particular scenarios or looking at even even simple methods like uh, regression analysis uh, building of initial scenarios important consider organizational learning implications identify research needs and develop quantitative models these are key considerations but what is the downside Scenario planning can be costly and inaccurate and it might end up using up substantial resources and time. The tendency for cultural distortion and for people to get carried away can be high. The risk of the self-fulfilling prophecy, thinking about the scenario may be the cause of it. I'm sure you have personal examples that can relate to this. Uh, you thought too much and uh, ultimately the little nuances of the things that you had done had led to that very particular outcome. Must be careful of that. Many scenarios considered might not actually occur. So again, it relates to the loss of time and effort and all that. The upside uh, focuses management attention on future possibilities, encourages creative thinking, can be used to justify a decision, encourages communication through participation process can identify the sources of uncertainty and it encourages companies to consider fundamental changes in the external environment. So you have to be very careful when you are commissioning a scenario planning exercise because you now you are aware of both the downside and the upside and therefore uh, you have to play it smart as usual. Right. Finally, we are going to look at game theory. Uh, not in detail because you are looking at game theory in E3 but the primary focus here is going to be on the risk side of things. But to start with a quick recap, game theory has been used to great effect in the aspect of anticipating the actions of competitors and acting accordingly. It has two key principles. One, strategists can take a rational informed view of what competitors are likely to do and formulate a suitable response. So that is the predictable nature of competition. If a strategy exists that allows a competitor to dominate us, then our priority is to eliminate that strategy. So you're looking at what the competitor could do rationally and what the competitor could do irrationally. In both cases, you have to come up with strategies that can face the count or rather counter strategies to face that situation successfully. Uh, quick illustration, suppose there are two companies A and B who between them dominate a market, both are considering whether to increase their marketing spend from its current low level. If one firm decides to increase its spend, then it will see its returns increase. If both increase the spend, both of them end up with lower returns than at present because the market gets diluted. So a common application of game theory is in price wars. Price wars between two evenly matched competitors usually results in lower profits for everyone and no change in the market share. Nobody wins except the customer. And this is classic game theory predictability scenario. So in essence, what you need to pay attention when you're using game theory is you one on the one end, you don't really want to deep dive into this and end up putting up a lot of effort and rethinking into strategies that are not viable. And uh, one of the fundamental problems, especially in terms of you know corporate planning, and if you're really employing game theory or that kind of science, uh, is uh, people getting carried away. I have, I know this. 
I've seen this happening. So you have to be very careful and you have to hand pick counter strategies and uh, commit your resources very carefully. Um, then a uh, quick look at stress testing. Um, as you know and as the term suggests, it's a way of analyzing a business to consider how well it could cope in difficult conditions. It's important because when a business is doing well, it can be difficult to identify how it would fare if there was a sudden downturn in the economic environment. So Robert Simons published in the Harvard Business Review seven questions a business can ask itself to stress test and I think this is a good slide to complete our discussion on strategy risk. So if you are a business and if you think that uh, you don't want to be complacent then you can continuously stress test and the questions that you can ask yourself who is your primary customer, how do your core values prioritize shareholders, employees and customers. What critical performance variables are you tracking? What strategic boundaries have you set? How are you generating creative tension? How committed are your employees to helping each other? And what strategic uncertainties keep you awake at night? So actually in the, in the original article, there are responses to these questions also. But in general, the important lesson is you should know that as far as strategy risk is involved or concerned, uh, in order to ensure that our strategy is something that is sound and strong and solid and it can uh, really shape the business into what it wants to achieve and become to realize the mission and the vision and all that, uh, continuously stress testing can be a good thing while you are not uh, overdoing it. That is important. So uh, here as you can see in the brackets next to the questions prioritization, measurement and productivity and flexibility. These are the four key categorizations that you need to look at when you are stress testing yourself. Are you flexible? Are you productive? Are you measuring the right thing? And have you prioritized the right aspects? Uh, I think not only just for business. But you can look at these four angles, four areas, even if you're stress testing yourself, your personal life. And on that note, we've reached the end of this segment. This is a revision snapshot, as you can see. Uh, we looked at many things here. Uh, firstly, we quickly recapped strategy, and then we understood that uh, there are so many ways of strategic planning and strategic options generation. And in each of those, classically, that we've learned, there are risky angles and we learned those. On the other hand, we looked at disruption and the fact that we need to be careful of disruption. Then we looked at scenario planning, the fact that it is, it, it is there are upsides, but there are also key downside considerations. And finally, we looked at stress testing because we really don't want the business to end up becoming complacent and thinking that we are always safe. It can happen especially if you are too comfortable in your zone and time passes by and you haven't stress tested and other competitors without you knowing even have slowly uh, gained market share or caught up to you. That is uh, the snapshot of strategy risk. So as usual, keep learning and uh, do enjoy the process. On that note, the Segment number three, strategy risk comes to an end. I hope the session was very useful. And I've covered everything that is important. It's a complete essentials revision. Uh, thank you all for joining. Stay tuned for another segment. Happy learning and all the best.